Welcome everybody to Book Buzz, our October edition. I cannot believe it's been two months since the last one. Um, we will be back uh, to do another one in December. Uh, so keep it on the calendar for that. Um, so I'm here with Shermaine. Shermaine is our cataloging and technical services librarian. She selects uh, adult, fish, adult fiction and a number of other things. Uh, and she's reading Monsters, Movies, and Mayhem. Or she was last week. Maybe she's not anymore. Um, <laughs> I'm the adult services librarian who selects adult nonfiction. Uh, and I was reading Untamed Shore by Sylvia Moreno-Garcia. I finished that last week. Now I'm reading uh, a boyfriend project by an author I'm going to talk about in just a few minutes. And Meg Miller is our adult services librarian who selects our special collections, and she's going to be talking about our adult graphic novels. And she was reading On Earth, We're Briefly Gorgeous. So I just wanted to show you something on the website that we added fairly recently. Um, if you go to Books and Media and then click on adult book list, there's a whole slew of lists there that you can look through to find books. But if you still can't find anything you want, you can click on the form here and that will go to us and we will handpick some books for you uh, to review and hopefully you like them. And if you want to know what we've got on the new bookshelf, you can go to our catalog under the what's hot and book lists and our awesome office manager, Kim, puts in all the new titles that we get every month and she breaks them out uh, by age and whether they are fiction or nonfiction. Uh, so November is National Novel Writing Month, and we're going to have a bunch of author visits virtually. The first one is a romance writers panel featuring Kathy Maxwell, Farrah Rashawn, Sophie Jordan, and Karma Kelly. And you can sign up for that right now. The Friends of the Library also purchased a bunch of their books for us to give away for those who attend. Yeah. Um, and then Meg is, is this your last yeah, um, she's working with the Sisters in Crime, uh, the local Sisters in Crime group to do mystery talks. Um, so that one's going to premiere on November 9th. We also have uh, local author Tracy Lander Garrett giving a class on world building and fantasy writing on November 18th. And then for Pink Night, we have a guest author. Uh, her name is Colby Bloom, and she has a new book coming out that I'll talk about in just a few minutes on painting um, landscapes. So our list, our main list to get the kit of supplies is full, but you can sign up for the waiting list for that. And you never know, people might cancel and then there might be kits available for that. All right. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Charmaine. And she is going to go over adult fiction. Our first book um, came out in September. And so um, my book list is going to be about some spooky things, some Christmas in October, all kinds of things. Um, so this first one is about um, a werewolf, of course, but it's from a, a long time series. So you don't have to read the first ones or whatever. Um, Jane Jameson happened to be a... Um, is a series about a children's librarian that became a vampire. So now she's like the leader of this vampire um, coven or whatever in this uh, little um, half moon hollow town. So this is about uh, one of the stories about one of the occupants in the town. And this is a werewolf that falls in love with a music teacher who happens to be a vampire. Um, and instead of falling in love with a good uh, werewolf like she wanted to, um, she falls in love with him. And then people start um, threatening the vampires and vampire business in town. And so she comes together with them to figure things out. Um, and there is a vampire named Dick Cheney, no relation. Um, but there's a whole gang of people in Half Moon Hollow. And um, the, this is a series that's been continuing um, for a couple of years now. But you don't have to read the first one. You can start with... Um, a lot of them to find, um, you know, ones you like and different things like that. But Molly Harper writes a lot of things. Um, Bewitched, Betwixt, and Between. So the first book was about, um, this is by Dorinda Jones. And so she also wrote a series about a grim reaper um, who happened to be a woman and happened to be the portal between heaven and hell. Um, and she can speak any language in the world and also can see ghosts and helps ghosts kind of cross over and different things like that. So 
This book is a new series, but this is the second book because the first book came out in February and this book came out the 28th. And this is about a changeling, which is one of the most powerful witches on the planet, who at 40 finds out she is one of the most powerful witches on the planet. So, of course, she has to move to Sleepy Hollow and inherit her grandmother's house. And she has all this power. And one of her powers that is like the... the, not the most powerful, but is one of her grounding powers as a witch, so to speak, is that she can find lost things. And it doesn't matter what it is, inanimate objects or people, whatever it is, she can find it, wherever it is. Um, and so there are witches who are trying to steal her powers, of course. Uh, why not? And this is about also being 40 and fabulous and like everything that you think about as um, you are middle-aged or becoming older um that you're breaking all these kind of stereotypes so it's a good book to read if you like that and you also like witches and scary things i'm excited for slay because i love vampire fiction and a lot of um black authors got together and wrote uh from mocha memoirs press and they wrote slay and the reason that this is such a good uh book is also because it's from the diaspora of all over um of african diaspora so there are vampire hunters and vampires are actually kind of like heroes in many different shades in this um series so there's like african deities resistance fighters there's a, a matriarchal group of uh, vampires and like all kinds of stories. Um, and so it's really groundbreaking because it's Afrocentric. And it's also, like I said, about the cultural heritage of African diaspora, but with vampires. Um, Ties That Tether um, came out the 28th of, of September. And it's about a Nigerian woman who falls in love with somebody who is not Nigerian. And the reason that this is important to her is because she promised her dying father at 12 that she would marry a Nigerian to preserve the culture, even though they immigrated to Canada. And so she hasn't found any luck and found any men that she's in love with, but she falls in love with this white guy. And he's handsome. He loves her. They end up working together after they've had a one night stand because why not? Right. Um, and so she's caught between how she feels about him and trying to please her mother. And so is she going to really maintain her identity, which is very important to her? Um, or is she going to follow her heart and fight for her happiness? Choosing the Chief. This is a really, really, really good series. And this book, um, the second book in the Sexy Sovereign series. So these novels are set in Ghana, Africa. And it's about Guyanian royalty. And so this particular book is different from the first. The first book was called Choosing um, a King. And it's about Kofi, who happens to be kind of like his brother, but cousin. Uh, you have to read to find out what that means and how that is. And Kofi um, is the king. And he is his brother. Cousin is kind of like the chief. And he's an alpha male. And for those of you who romance that don't know what alpha males are, uh, we'll tell you later. But uh, very not domineering or controlling, but very much in charge, very powerful presence at all times is basically um, a good summary of what an alpha is. And um, these are best friends that fall in love and they're trying not to because they've been friends since forever. And Maya is a Ph.D. in African-American studies and Adam is um like a hedge fund manager so he's like a this billionaire um and they love each other a lot but Maya gets in an accident and then they have to start being together and like figuring out their feelings and when two people are alphas because she's like an alpha female she's really strong really um present um known when she walks in the room um voice everything commanding um how do those two people romance each other but there is a happily after without telling you everything. But it's also really, really steamy. So if you are really, really into books that, you know, have sex and drama and all these different things, this is another good one for you. And that came out in October. And the first one came out in August. And they're available on Amazon. But we're going to be ordering those soon, too. 
Um, Lisa Unger came out with this book um, um, on October 6th called Confessions on 745. So this is about like if strangers on the train get really, really weird. And that's exactly what happened. So she, uh, Selena meets um, this woman named Martha. And like suddenly, as you do, I guess you meet a stranger on a train and tell him, I think my husband's cheating on me. And then she's like, oh, I think I've been cheating with my boss. And then you're like, you never see each other again. But then Selena's nanny disappears and she starts to think that this woman that she never thought she would see again may have something to do with this. And her marriage is starting to fall apart, but she's starting to wonder who this Martha woman really is. And she's going to discover that it's not even close to what she probably thought she was. Um, Simmer Down by Sarah Smith is a really good book. So this is another book of hers that's really good. Faking It was the first one. So this one is about Nikki. And um, Nikki becomes a food truck owner after being in all these restaurants to help her mom um, achieve her dream in Maui, Hawaii of being a food truck owner. And so she's doing all of these things and she really enjoys it. It's not her dream job, but she loves seeing the beach people come up and um, all these types of things and being on the beach. And then she meets this English food truck owner. And of course it's uh, like enemies to lovers type thing, but they start falling in love. And then you know, to add fuel to the fire, they enter uh, the Maui Food Festival to decide which one of them is going to keep their corner, their food truck area, like all these different things to decide out who's going to be the best on top. So is she going to trust her heart to him or is it going to get worse? Like what's going to go on? Are they going to make a truce? What's going to happen? But that's what that book is about. Um, Tiny Nightmares are really, really short stories um, about all kinds of scary things like monsters, but like Uber taking serial killers and witches that read minds and then broken hearted vampires, those types of things. So there's all kinds of spectrum, but they also explore like um, racism and social media addiction and homelessness and global warming and all these types of things. And also things that really, really, really scare you. So uh, yeah. My advice is, yeah, don't read it alone in the dark because there are a lot of stories in there that are just like, you know, kind of really scary. Um, but if you like to be scared, perfectly fine. There are all kinds of monsters, by the way. Um, so this came out the 13th by Jenny Holiday, who's really, really good at all types of like um, a step above like Hallmark fiction or whatever. Um and so this is about uh, Leo Ricci, who he's a cab driver from New York and he's an apartment owner in the Bronx taking care of his little sister. And suddenly he finds um, a real life princess in distress. And so um, she's a princess of Eldova and her father has like gone into like this tailspin because her mother died and her dad is like all depressed. And so she has to go back to the country to try to do some things, but she kind of needs help while she's trying to wrap up things that she's doing here. And so when she asked him to drive her for the rest of his trip, he agrees and he's thinking, I'm going to make all this money. But then he falls in love with her and it's so unexpected. And he thinks that he's on from the wrong side of the tracks and all these different things. But he finds out that he's not as far from the tracks as he thought he was. And she that's what he so Christmas in October. Uh, Good night, beautiful. Okay, if you like books that scare you, but like make your heart beat, like make it race, like make you think, um, this is definitely one of them. Um, she wrote Perfect Mother, which is a psychological thriller as well. So if you like to think and be scared, like, you know, thinking about what's going to happen, what's the next move, this is a good book for you. This came out the 13th as well. And so a psychiatrist and his wife moved back to his hometown and he starts to practice together. Um, um, he starts to practice, I mean, and they start their life together in this like upstate New York town. Um, and he's a therapist in the house. And so he's doing all these different things and all these clientele come in. And you can hear upstairs in a vent, like in a room, you can hear what goes on in like the 
um, I guess in his therapy sessions in his office. And so he goes missing and all of these things start being revealed and all these things come up and um, him and his wife have these things where they think about um, they have names for who like the people are. But is it really his wife? Is it a dream? Is it like, that's what I mean by psychological thriller. So I've read this and you will not believe what the ending is. You never can guess what the endings of these books are. And so if you like that type of fiction, that's good for you. Um, the Cookbook Club came out the 20th um, by Beth Harverson. There's always recipes inside of her books. So um, if you like cooking and reading, um, these are perfect. So um, these are about these newfound friends who have all these things going on. One of them is pregnant and she hasn't told her boyfriend or his mother. Um, one of them is like trying to open up a restaurant, but all these things keep happening. And another one... Um, she recently got dumped and decides to buy like this, basically this cottage and turn it into like a cooking type of retreat with, I guess, kind of like a, a cooking club, basically. And they all like find each other. And so this is about like um, women who form bonds and like do all of these things. And what's more important than friendship and food. So like you need that in life. So this is a feel good for that. Um, Plain Bad Heroines. This author is um, a YA fiction author, but this is her adult debut. So this is basically like Victorian lesbians who die in Freddy Krueger, Candyman-ish type of ways. Yeah, um, I had no idea there was like a fiction for that, but there are. And then on top of that, um, this girl's school basically is where the setting is. And these two girls die in this totally mysterious death in 1902. And all of a sudden, when the school ends up having to close, like Hollywood, of course, wants to make this movie. And all these strange things start happening with the people who are making this movie as well. And so this is really um it's kind of like a, a comedy uh, and a horror at the same time, but there's all these things happening and it's about the Gilded Age and like um, all these types of things and heroines and like uh, B-list actresses. There's so much going on, but there is a, a, like a timeline and a purpose. It's not like all over the place, but it's just all of this packed in. Um, so it's about the female spirit and um, all these types of things, but that's definitely what's going on. Um, the Silence, so this author, I'm really excited about this one too, because this author wrote this before, um, like a few weeks before COVID happened. So this is about a story about Super Bowl Sunday in 2022 and five people are at this dinner party and they're talking about like the theory of relativity and, and bourbon and all these different things. And then all of a sudden, every digital communication stops, ceases to work, period. So what happens when, like, basically the apocalypse happens and, like, how do you remain human, basically, so that's what the silence is about. And I doubt that he really knew that something like this would be happening in the near future. But um, if you're not afraid to read uh, apocalyptic type fiction, that's it. American Gospel is out October 27th. So this author is basically, this is another apocalyptic, but not try, quite dystopian book. But this is about, um, there's a farmer in, um, this small town in Minnesota. And suddenly he, this old man hears God tell him that the end is near in August 19th of 1974. So all these people are coming to um, the end of the world seekers and reporters. And one of them happens to be his son who is already skeptical of everything anyway, but his father's a little overbearing and they're estranged. And so then comes like this actress who has like ties between the two of them and all this is going on while the Nixon resignation is happening in the nation. And so all these splintering things are happening. So this is about uh, like battles within yourself and the souls of the nation and like dark coming out of light type thing. So um, this is what this book is about. I feel like a type of fiction. Dungeon Party for you gamers and role players. This is a game about uh, a book. I say game. A book about uh, role players who kick a 
basically kind of like a bad player out of him and he seeks revenge and they're trying to win a prize on top of this at the same time and so all these things are going on and they're um, trying to win the game but they're also trying to stop this um, gamer from you know wreaking more havoc than he is and you know the lines between fiction and real are starting to blur for everybody and that is coming out in November so get in touch with me. Let's get into reading. Let's get into reading all kinds of things. Um, so let me know what you like. You do have my email. If you have book clubs and you're trying to jog your mind about things you want to read, hit me up, please. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, I've got a great lineup of titles for you tonight. No, there is nothing wrong with your computer. Just setting the spooky scene for my first group of titles. Joe Hill, the mastermind behind Nosferatu and Lock and Key, has arrived at D.C. curating his own cutting-edge horror comics pop-up. Hill House Comics will terrify readers with a smart, subversive, and scary lineup of five original limited series. Debuting last month with Basketful of Heads written by Hill himself. This is the story of June Branch, a young woman trapped with four cunning criminals who have snatched her boyfriend for deranged reasons of their own. Now she must fight for her life with the help of an impossible 8th century Viking axe that can pass through a man's neck in a single swipe and leave the severed head still conscious and capable of supernatural speech. Each disembodied head is, has a male, male, malevolent story of its own to tell, and it isn't long before June finds herself in a desperate struggle to hack through their lies and manipulations, racing to save the man she loves before time runs out. Featuring incredible artwork by Leo Max, this spine-tingling collection includes the entire seven-issue miniseries, as well as character designs and behind-the-scenes sketches. Second was The Low, Low Woods from New York Times bestselling author Carmen Maria Machado. Shudder to think Pennsylvania has been on fire for years. The coal mines beneath it are long since abandoned. The woods are full of rabbits with human eyes, a deer woman who stalks hungry girls, and swaths of skinless men. And the people in Shudder to Think, well, they're not doing so well either. When Elle and Octavia wake up in a movie theater with no memory of the last few hours of their lives, the two teenage dirtbags begin a surreal and terrifying journey to discover the truth about the strange town that they call home. Like so many women in Shudder to Think before them, all they have is a void where the truth once was. But as time passes, Elle finds herself needing to know more about what has happened, while Octavia wants nothing more than to forget the forgetting. Can these two teens reconcile their differences before the horrible things lurking beneath their town emerge to swallow them whole? And first in October, uh, the Dollhouse family, where on Alice's sixth day, her dying great aunt sent her the birthday gift she never knew she always wanted, a big, beautiful 19th century dollhouse, complete with a family of antique dolls. In no time at all, the dollhouse isn't just Alice's favorite toy, it's her whole world. And soon, young Alice learns she can enter the house to visit a new group of friends, straight out of a heartwarming children's novel, The Dollhouse Family. But while The Dollhouse Family welcomes her with open arms, in the real world, her family life is becoming much more complicated. And deep within The Dollhouse's twisting halls is The, bla the Black Room Waits, with an offer for Alice. The house can fix all this, The Black Room says. All she has to do is say the words. From there unfolds a twisty, surreal, multi-generational horror tale that echoes into centuries past, into Alice's tormented future, and into the beating heart of the madness that makes up our world, literally. And writer Laura Marks of TV's Ray Donovan, The Expanse, and The Good Fight, and horror comics legend Kelly Jones from The Sandman and Batman Red Rain join forces to unleash spirits from beyond into DC's Hills House comics. Daphne Byrne, where in the gaslit splendor of late 19th century New York, rage builds inside 14-year-old Daphne. The sudden death of her father has left her alone with her grief-stricken mother, who becomes easy prey for a group of occultists, promising to connect her dead husband. While fighting to disentangle her mother from these charlatans, Daphne begins to sense a strange, insidious presence in her own body, an entity with unspeakable appetites. What does brother want? And could Daphne stop him even if she tried? And closing out this group, we get Plunge in November, also written by Joe Hill. In the aftermath of a devastating tsunami, 
an exploration vessel known as the derelict begins sending an automated distress signal from a remote atoll in the Bering Strait. The only problem is that the derelict has been missing for 40 years. Marine biologist Moriah Lamb joins the Carpenter Wreck removal team to recover the derelict's dead, only to find that in this remote part of the Arctic Circle, the dead have plenty to say to the living. There's something down in the icy darkness of the Arctic Sea, something that doesn't want to be found. Unlike on land, where terror shows itself, when the long-lost crew of the derelict emerges from caves. They seem as though they haven't aged a day. It's as if they're exactly the same as the day they disappeared, except they're all missing their eyes. Will the salvage crew survive to bring their findings to shore? What danger await waits for them if they fail? What danger awaits us all should they succeed? And what I actually just finished on Overdrive is this, Solutions and Other Problems, an instant number one New York Times bestseller from Gallery Books. For the first time in seven years, Ali Brush, beloved author and artist of the extraordinary bestseller Hyperbole and a Half, returns with a new collection of comedic, autobiographical, and illustrated essays. Solutions and Other Problems includes humorous stories from Ali Brush's childhood, the adventures of her very bad animals, merciless dis dissection of her own character flaws, incisive essays on grief, loneliness, and powerlessness, as well as reflections on the absurdity of modern life. This full color, beautifully illustrated edition features all new material with more than 1600 pieces of art. And so in October, this month brought us new volumes in some popper, popular and award-winning series, starting with some image comics titles, Monstrous Volume 5, the next volume in the best-selling Eisner, Hugo, Harvey, and British Fantasy Award-winning series by Marjorie Liu and Santa Takata. The long-dreaded war between the Federation and Arcanics is about to explode. Micah must choose her next steps. Will she help her friends or strike out on her own? The series is amazing. And October 6th also gave us Gunning for Ramirez, Act 1. What if the deadliest assassin in all of Mexico, a man with a dozens of kills to his name, was actually a vacuum repairman in Arizona? Falcon City, Arizona. Jock Ramirez works at Robotop, the leading home appliance company in the Southwest United States. Jock is efficient, thorough, and discreet. The last one is easy. He's also mute. But everything changes when two members of one of Paso de Rio's largest drug cartels stumbles upon Jock and believe him to be the deadly hitman who betrayed them in the past, the ruthless Ramirez. Could it be that the cartel's legendary cleanup man is really a legendary vacuum cleaner expert? Now that they've found him, men of the cartel will do everything they can to kill this traitor. A tribute to the action thrillers of the 80s and 90s, a brutal narrative with never a dull moment. Gunning for Ramirez is as much a descendant of Friedkin's To Live and Die in L.A. as it is Tarantino's Pulp Fiction or Rodriguez's Mexico Trilogy. And I love when we get graphic novels from ap academic publishers. So Rutgers University Press just released the first ever graphic biography of Paul Robeson, Ballad of an American, which charts Robeson's career as a singer, actor, scholar, athlete, and activist who achieved global fame. Through his films, concerts, and records, he became a potent symbol representing the promise of a multicultural, multiracial American democracy at a time when, despite his stardom, he was denied personal access to many of his audiences. Robeson was a major figure in the rise of anti-colonialism in Africa and elsewhere, and a tireless campaigner for internationalism, peace, and human rights. Later in life, he embraced the civil rights and anti-war movements with the hope that new generations would attain his ideals of a peaceful and abundant world. Ballad of an American features beautifully drawn chapters by artist Sharon Rudolph, a compelling narrative about his life, and an afterward on the lasting impact of Robeson's work in both the arts and politics. This graphic biography will enable all kinds of readers, especially new readers who may be unfamiliar with him, to understand his life story and everlasting global significance. Ballad of an American, a graphic biography of Paul Robeson is published in conjunction with Rutgers University's centennial commemoration of Robeson's 1919 graduation from the university. And here's a fun one. We have Kodasha Comics' Heaven's Design Team. God created the heavens and the earth, but little known fact, he outsourced the animals to the office of Heaven's Design Team. This hilarious and educational manga features weird real life animals and puts even some humdrum critters in a strange new light. This isn't your average design agency. Their assignment, make the animals that will populate earth to God's exacting specs. As their reject 
unexpected designs pile up, literally, the team may worry that they'll never get it right. But that's often when inspiration strikes. The result might be a giraffe, a koala, or something new, weird, wonderful, and real. Welcome to the Wild Thing Factory. It's now a hilarious anime. And the English language version of Volume 2 actually comes out in November, so I'm going to slide it in here. They love their work, the giraffe, the koala, the ping pong tree sponge. But their divine client's demands are often vague, and the results are sometimes wild in more ways than one. Then there's prototyping and testing to worry about, not to mention Miss Pluto's penchant for grotesque, and Mr. Saturn, who just wants to make everything look like a horse. But in the end, all creatures, great and small, get their due. And back to some image comics titles with this one. I'm, I'm at work, people. Uh, though I recommend the interview uh, with the title's creators on the Publishers Weekly YouTube. Um, the It was their live on tap event. Okay. Apparently, I should have. All right. Now it's like super spooky, huh? Okay. Um, I should have left it. Vienna, 1889. Dracula's brides nail him to the bottom of his coffin. Los Angeles, 1974. An aging starlet decides to raise the stakes. Crime scene photographer Quincy Harker is the only man who knows it happened, but will anyone believe him before he gets his own chalk outline? And are Dracula's three brides there to help him or use him as bait? A pulpy, pulse-pounding graphic novel of California psych horror from acclaimed creators Alex DeCampi and Erica Henderson. And a couple of series that we've actually highlighted in previous book buzzes with their first volume. Uh, this is Family Tree Volume 2, Seeds. The supernatural family drama continues. Grandpa Judd refuses to give up the fight with the arborists, even if his young granddaughter Meg begins what could be her final transformation into a tree. Or is it the world that will be transformed forever? And Bitterroot Volume 2, Rage and Redemption. Monster hunting has been the Sangre family business for generations as they battle the genome. Hideous creatures born out of hate and racism. But now the Sangres face a different threat, the deadly Inzondo, a new kind of monster born out of grief and trauma, with one of their own turning into an Inzondo and an army of tortured souls on the attack in 1920s Harlem. The Sangre family must once again fight to save the world unless their own pain and suffering transforms them into monsters as well. And we've made it to the November new releases. There's some great titles next month. Let's start with Under Earth from Top Shelf Productions, the most ambitious graphic novel to date from rising indie star Chris Gooch. Under Earth takes place in a subterranean landfill hollowed out to serve a, as a massive improvised prison, sunken into the trash and debris of the past. Game Boys, iPhones, coffee cups, old cars. We follow two parallel stories. In the first, a new arrival struggles to adapt to the everyday violence, physical labor, and poverty of the prison city. Overwhelmed and alone, he finds a connection with a fellow inmate through an old beat-up novel. While these two silent and uncommunicative men grow closer thanks to their book, the stress of their environment will test their new bond. Meanwhile, a pair of thieves pull off a risky job in exchange for the prison's schematics and the promise of escape, only to be betrayed by their employer. On the run with their hope for escape now gone, the two women set their minds to revenge. Yet as they lay their plans, their focus shifts from an obsession with the outside world to the life they have with each other. Equal parts, sincerity, and violence, Under Earth explores humanity's inextinguishable drive to find meaning, connection, and even family, and how fragile such constructions can be. Next is My Broken Mariko from Yen Press. Tomio Shino has stood by her friend Mariko through years of abuse, abandonment, and depression. However horrific her circumstances, their friendship has been the one reassuring constant in Mariko's life, and Tomio's too. That is, until Tomio is utterly blindsided by the news of Mariko's death. In life, Tomio felt powerless to help her best friend out of the darkness that ultimately drove her over the edge. Now, Tomio is determined to liberate Mariko's ashes for one final journey together, to set free her dear, broken Mariko. And back again to some image comics titles with blue and green the dark and haunting portrayal of a young musician's pursuit of creative genius, the monstrous nature of which threatens to consume him as it did his predecessor half a century ago. From creators Ram V and Anand RK, Blue and Green is an exploration of ambitions, expectations, and the horrific depths of their spiraling pursuit. 
And I credit and thank Betty for letting me know about this series way back when. Um, I actually thought it had finished, but we get next month Nailbiter Volume 7, Nailbiter Returns. Joshua Williamson and Mike Henderson's critically acclaimed hit horror series returns. Is the Nailbiter alive? Where is Sheriff Crane? Are they part of the serial killer copycat's horrific game of death? The only person who can answer all these questions is the Nailbiter's daughter. And this might be the perfect title for this election season. On the stump, the campaign trail is paved with blood and broken bones. History diverged on one fateful day in 1868 when presidential candidate Horatio Seymour lost his temper mid-debate and violently attacked Ulysses S. Grant, earning him not only widespread popularity, but the presidency as well. Today, elections are decided by brutal, highly publicized hand-to-hand -hand combat in arenas called stumps. And in a society that adores violence this much, it's no surprise that powerful people get away with murder. But not for long, not if Senator Jack Hammer and FBI agent Annabelle Lister have anything to say about it. Eisner nominated writer Chuck Brown teams up with artists Francesco Chiapara and letterer Clayton Cowles for a political action series set in a hyper violent world full of countless injustices and people who have to fight for their place in it. And 30 years after Batman the Killing Joke changed comics forever, Batman Three Jokers from DC Black Label re examines the myth of who or what the Joker is, and what is at the heart of his eternal battle with Batman. New York Times bestselling writer Jeff Johns and Jason Fabuk, the writer-artist team that waged war, the Dark Seed War in the pages of Justice League, reunite to tell the ultimate story of Batman and the Joker. Who are the three Jokers? Batman doesn't understand how or why, but the fact is certain. The man he has spent a lifetime chasing isn't one man at all. There are three Jokers. Now that he knows the unbelievable truth, Bruce needs real answers. Joined by Barbara Gordon and Jason Todd, two former victims of the Joker's brutality, the Dark Knight is finally on a path to defeat the madman once and for all, every last one of him. And these two are adorable and hilarious. Check out their YouTube channel for some of their Q&A videos. Based on the wildly popular webcomic, One of Those Days, chronicles the life and love of Yuta and Maya Devere as they take on the minutiae of marriage, the ups and downs of daily life, and the paradigm shift of new parenthood. They began illustrating their life in comics when they moved into their first apartment together in Tel Aviv as newlyweds. In the years since, one of those days has become one of the biggest web comics on the internet, with millions of followers around the world. Yuta Devere grew up on superhero comic books, and the Devere's visual style is downright kinetic and bursting with life. In this collection, the first time that the De Beers comics have been compiled in one volume, they share stories that are heartwarming, hilarious, and universally recognizable. So even for those who don't feel like pulling out an assault rifle to wage war on a kitchen cockroach, the De Beers challenges and triumphs are instantly familiar to anyone who has had one of those days. And a new series from Ani Press, Backtrack Volume 1, a former criminal driver is given the chance at redemption by entering a car race, but there's just one catch. Each leg covers a different period in history. If you had a chance to fix a mistake from your past, would you take it? Allison Levy would. Guilt weighs heavily on the former criminal wheelman, Allison, who led an illicit life that left her shatter. Enter Casper Quillix, an eccentric businessman who offers her the break of a lifetime, a massive cross-country car race that grants the winner an opportunity to correct a single mistake in their life. But here's the catch. Each leg covers a different period in history, as if keeping the cars on the often questionable, sometimes non-existent roads and staying ahead of competition wasn't enough. The drivers will now have to contend with medieval warriors, dinosaurs, and natural disasters. It's all a possibility. Only the one who survives it all will be proven the winner. And like that, Allison and the rest of the drivers find themselves in a gut-wrenching race through time and quickly learn that they must band together to form any chance of survival. But for an opportunity to turn back time, Allison will drive from the Big Bang to the death knell of the universe. And Top Shelf Productions gives us The Book Tour, a page-turning Kafka-esque dark comedy in brilliant retro style. This graphic novel watches one man try to keep it together while everything falls apart. Upon the publication of his latest novel, G.H. Fretwell, a minor English writer, embarks on a book tour to promote it. Nothing is going according to plan, and his trip gradually turns into a nightmare. 
But now the police want to ask him some questions about a mysterious disappearance, and it seems that Fretwell's troubles are only just beginning. In his first book for adults in many years, acclaimed cartoonist Andy Watson evokes all the anxieties felt by every writer and compresses them into a gem of a book. Witty, surreal, and sharply observant, the book tour offers a captivating lesson in letting go. And my penultimate title of the night is This Beauty from Image, The Ludocrats, The Aristocrats of Ludicrous, Defending Reality from the Encroaching Forces of Boredom While Having a Nice Time. A collision of the ornate fantasy of Dune and an M-rated asterisk and obelisk. Baron Otto von Hades and Professor Hades Zero K are here, and they're going to save us all. Have a nice time. The blurbs for each issue on the Image website are hilarious. I'm not going to read them all, but issue three says, Ludocrats, the comics that made its whole creative team shout, oh God, what have we done? Why didn't anyone stop us on a monthly basis? And one final title. The Neil Gaiman Library Volume 2 from Dark Horse Books, this deluxe oversized collection of comic stories from celebrated and award-winning writer Neil Gaiman in conjunction with some of comics' greatest, most acclaimed creators. In these four essential Gaiman tales, a group of friends search for a mysterious circus that is either a dream or a nightmare. A string of bizarre occult events befall strangers from all walks of life. A woman is given the gift of a harlequin's heart, and a young boy is followed by monsters and regrets that last a lifetime. Collections and collects the full graphic novels, the facts in the case of the departure of Miss Finch, likely stories, Harlequin Valentine, and the Troll Bridge. Does Pflugerville Library own the Neil Gaiman Library Volume 1, you ask? No. Uh, because we have each of those stories individually in our collection. But Volume 2 contains stories that we didn't have, so we're getting that one. And that's all the titles for me today. As always, I'm happy to get title requests or to answer questions. Thank you. And I will never do it from in Thornton Room again, apparently, because the lights go off. All right. So I have some adult nonfiction. I'll start with biographies and memoirs. So we have This Time Next Year We'll Be Laughing by Jacqueline Winspear. After 16 novels, Jacqueline Winspear, author of the best-selling Maisie Dobbs series, has taken the bold step of turning to memoir, revealing the hardships and joys of her family history. Her story tackles the difficult, poignant, and fascinating family accounts of her paternal grandfather's shell shock, her mother's evacuation from London during the Blitz, her soft-spoken, animal-loving father's torturous assignment to an explosive during World War II, her parents' years living with Romani gypsies and Winsbury's own childhood picking hops and fruit on farms in rural Kent, capturing her ties to the land and her dream of being a writer at its very inception. Conditional Citizens by Leila Alami. What does it mean to be an American? In this starkly illuminating and impassioned book, Pulitzer Prize finalist Leila Alami recounts her unlikely journey from Moroccan immigrant to U.S. citizen using it as a starting point for her exploration of the rights, liberties, and protections that are traditionally associated with American citizenship. And this book probably does not need my help. I'm sure it will sell millions and millions of copies, but we have A Promised Land by Barack Obama. In the stirring, highly anticipated first volume of his presidential memoirs, Barack Obama tells the story of his improbable odyssey from young man searching for his identity to leader of the free world, Describing in strikingly personal detail his political education and the landmark moments of his of the first term of his historic presidency, a time of dramatic transformation and turmoil. This powerful book captures Barack Obama's conviction that democracy is not a gift from on high, but something founded on empathy and common understanding and built together day by day. Dolly Parton. This is one of two books about Dolly Parton coming out in November, um, but this one was written by Dolly. As told, to Dolly, as told by Dolly Parton, in her own words, explore the songs that have defined her journey. Illustrated throughout with previously unpublished images from Dolly Parton's personal and business archives and mining over 60 years of songwriting, Songteller highlights 175 of Dolly's songs and brings readers behind the lyrics. Next we have The Book Collectors by Delphine Minoui. Dorai is a town outside Damascus the very spot where the Syrian civil war began. Drea fell under siege in 2012. For four years, no one entered or left and aid was blocked. Every single day, bombs fell on this place, a place of homes and families, schools and children, now emptied and broken into bits. 
and then a group searching for survivors stumbled upon a cache of books in the rubble. In the midst of the siege, the journalist Delphine Minoui tracked down one of the library's founders, 23-year-old Ahmad. Over text and social media messages, Minoui came to know the young men who gathered at the library, even as bombs kept falling from above. By telling their stories, Minoui makes a far-off, complicated war immediate and reveals these young men to be everyday heroes as inspiring as the books they read. The Book Collectors is a testament to their bravery and a celebration of the power of words. Next, we have No Time Like the Future by Michael J. Fox. The entire world knows Michael J. Fox through numerous movie and TV roles and his work in Parkinson's, uh, and his work, Parkinson's Advocate. His previous memoirs dealt with how he came to terms with his um, diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, all while the uh, exhibited his iconic optimism. His new memoir reassesses this outlook as events in the past decade presented additional challenges. In No Time Like the Future, Michael shares personal stories and observations about illness and health, aging, the strength of family and friends, and how our perceptions about time affect the way we approach mortality. He describes challenges that nearly caused him to ditch his trademark optimism and get out of the lemonade business altogether. Does he make it all the way back? You'll have to read the book to find out. Next, we have One Life by Megan Rapinoe. Megan Rapinoe was four years old when she kicked her first soccer ball. Her parents encouraged her love for the game, but taught her that winning was much less important than how she lived her life. In One Life, Rapinoe reflects on the choices she's made, her victories and her failures, and embarks on a thoughtful and candid discussion of her personal journey into social justice. After the 2011 World Cup, discouraged by how few athletes were willing to discuss their sexuality, Rapino decided to come out publicly as gay and use her platform to advocate for marriage equality. Rapino discusses the obligation we all have to speak up and the impact each of us can have on our communities. Next, we have Golem Girl, a memoir. In 1958, amongst the children born with spina bifida is Reva Lehrer. At the time, most such children are not expected to survive. Her parents and doctors are determined to fix her sending the message over and over again that she is broken. Everything changes when, as an adult, Riva is invited to join a group of artists, writers, and performers who are building disability culture. Their work is daring, edgy, funny, and dark. They insist that disability is an opportunity for creativity and resistance. Written with the vivid cinematic prose of a visual artist, Golem Girl is an extraordinary story of tenacity and creativity. With the author's magnificent portraits of her friends featured throughout, this memoir invites us to stretch ourselves toward a world where bodies flow between all possible forms of what it is to be human. So we've got The Greatest Beer Run Ever by John Chick Donahue and JT Malloy. One night in 1967, 26-year-old John Donahue, known as Chick, was out with friends drinking in a New York City bar. One of them came up with a wild idea. Someone should sneak into Vietnam, track down their buddies there, give them messages of support from back home and share a few laughs over a can of beer. It would be the greatest beer run ever, but who'd be wild enough to do it? John Donahue, a US Marine Corps veteran turned merchant mariner, wasn't about to desert his buddies on the front lines when they needed him. This is a story of that epic beer run told in Chick's own words and those of the men he visited in Vietnam. This is soon to be a major motion picture written and directed by Peter Farrelly. Black Diamond Queens by Maureen Mann. African-American women have played a pivotal part in rock and roll, from laying its foundations and singing chart-topping hits to influencing some of the genre's most iconic acts. In Black Diamond Queens, Maureen Mann draws on recordings, press coverage, archival materials, and interviews to document the history of African-American women in rock and roll between the 1950s and the 1980s, and details the musical contributions and cultural impact of Big Mama Thornton, Laverne Baker, Tina Turner, Mary Clayton, LaBelle, and others. By uncovering this history, hidden history of Black women in rock and roll, Man reveals a powerful sonic legacy that continues to reverberate into the 21st century. And The Dead Are Arising, The Life, Life of Malcolm X by Les and Tamara Payne. Les Payne, the renowned Pulitzer Prize winning investigative journalist, embarked in 1990 on a nearly 30 year long quest to interview anyone he could find who had actually known Malcolm X. All living siblings of the Malcolm Little family, classmates, street friends, cellmates, Nation of Islam figures, FBI moles and cops, and political leaders around the world. 
His goal was ambitious to transform what would become over 100 hours of interviews into an unprecedented portrait of Malcolm X, one that would separate fact from fiction. The result is this historic biography that conjures a never before seen world of its protagonist. Setsugo's Secret by Shirley Ann Higuchi. As children, Shirley Ann Higuchi and her brothers knew Heart Mountain only as a place their parents met, imagining it as a great stardust ballroom in rural Wyoming. As they grew older, they would come to recognize the name as a source of great sadness and shame for their older family members, part of the generation of Japanese Americans forced into the hastily built concentration camp in the aftermath of Executive Order 9066. Only after a serious cancer diagnosis did Shirley's mother, Setsuko, share her vision for a museum at the site of the former camp. After Setsuko's death, Shirley skeptically accepted an invitation to visit the site, a journey that would forever change her life and introduce her to a part of her mother she never knew. Moving seamlessly between family and communal history, Setsuko's secret offers a clear window into the camp life that was rarely revealed to the children of the incarcerated. The Zealot and the Emancipator, by H.W. Brands. In this book, acclaimed historian H.W. Brands tells a thrilling and page-turning account of how two American giants shaped the war for freedom. John Brown was a charismatic and deeply religious man who heard the God of Old Testament speaking to him, telling him to destroy slavery by any means. When Congress opened Kansas territory to slavery in 1854, Brown and his band of followers began to wage a bloody violent war on pro-slavery settlers Brown's violence points an ambitious Illinois lawyer and former office holder Abraham Lincoln toward a different solution to slavery, politics. Lincoln spoke cautiously and dreamed big, plotting his path back to Washington and perhaps to the White House. Yet his caution could not protect him from the vortex of violence Brown had set in motion. After Brown's arrest, his righteous dignity on the way to the gallows led many in the North to see him as a martyr to liberty. Southerners responded with anger and horror to a terrorist being made into a saint. Lincoln shrewdly threaded the needle between the opposing voices of the fractured nation and one election as a president. But the time for moderation had passed and Lincoln's fervent belief that democracy could resolve its moral crises peacefully faced its ultimate test. So we have Wilderness Watercolor Landscapes by Colby Bloom. From a striking desert sunset silhouette to a majestic Icelandic waterfall to an eye-catching magical snowy forest, watercolor artist Colby Bloom's wilderness scenes are the perfect introduction to watercolor painting. And this book contains all the tips, tricks, and techniques you'll need to master the basics. And it's also great for more um, seasoned artists looking for something new to paint. And Colby will be joining us on November 19th via YouTube. So if you check out our calendar, you may be able to sign up for the waiting list for that. We have Kauai Resin and Clay Workshop by Alex Lee. Um, author and crafter Alex Lee of Polymomo Tea. Um, the Polymomo Tea page on YouTube and Instagram fame shares his amazing techniques, tips, and tricks for creating awe-inspiring, heart-stoppingly cute, tiny projects to wear and give. For those who are going to start doing some holiday baking, we have Pie Academy by Ken Hadrick. Trusted cookbook author and pie expert Ken Hedrick delivers the only pie cookbook you'll ever need. Novice and experienced bakers will discover the secrets to baking a perfect pie from scratch. It's got step-by-step -step photos that will give you the confidence you need to choose and prepare the best crust for different types of fillings. Make pie dough, work with an all-purpose whole wheat or a gluten-free flour, roll out dough, select the correct pan, and add flawless finishing details. It includes 255 recipes for every kind and style of pie you can think of. This collection serves up 40 years of pie wisdom in a single satisfying package. And for the cookie lovers, we have 100 Cookies by Sarah Kiefer. Chocolatey, fruity, crispy, chewy, classic, inventive. There's a foolproof recipe for the perfect treat for everyone in this book. Recipes range from the classic chocolate chip, made three different ways, to bars, brownies, and blondies that reflect a wide range of flavors and global inspiration. Nearly every recipe is accompanied by a photograph. This is the comprehensive yet charming cookbook every cookie lover needs. Chicano Eats by Esteban Castillo. Esteban grew up in Santa Ana, California, where more than three quarters of the population is Latino. Because Mexican food was the foundation of his childhood, he was surprised to see recipes for dishes on popular food blogs that were anything but the traditional meals he grew up eating. 
So he created the blog Chicano Eats to showcase his love for design, cooking, and culture and provide a space for authentic Latino voices, recipes, and stories to be heard. Building on his blog, Chicano Eats is a bicultural and bilingual cookbook that translates 85 traditional and fusion Mexican recipes as gorgeous to look at as they are sublime to eat. Chicano Eats is packed with easy, flavorful recipes. And we have the Friends Cookbook by Amanda Yi. Gather your friends and prepare to say how you do into more than 100 recipes inspired by the beloved hit sitcom. Whether you're a seasoned chef like Monica, Monica Geller, just starting a catering business like Phoebe Buffet, I'm sorry, I've never seen Friends, I don't know how to say her name, but Phoebe, or a regular old food enthusiast like Joey Tribbiani, the Friends, the official cookbook, offers a variety of recipes for chefs of all levels. And for our Dungeons and Dragons players, we have Heroes Feast from the dandy experts behind Dungeons and Dragons Art and Arcana comes a cookbook that invites fantasy lovers to celebrate the unique culinary creations and traditions of their favorite fictional cultures. Heroes Feast includes recipes for snacking, such as elven bread and savory hand pies, as well as hearty vegetarian, meaty, and fish mains. There are also featured desserts and cocktails and everything in between to satisfy a craving for any adventure. Skinny Southern Baking by Laura Lynn Carter. From the creator of Skinny Southern, Emmy Award-winning chef Laura Lynn Carter comes another collection of delicious, nutritious versions of your favorite Southern foods. Satisfy your cravings with completely gluten-free, dairy-free, refined sugar-free baked goods that don't skip on flavor. And we've got a lot of poetry coming out this fall. We have Dearly by Margaret Atwood. It's her first collection of poetry in over a decade. And in it, she addresses themes such as love, loss, the passage of time, the na nature of nature, and zombies. Her new poetry is introspective and personal in tone, but wide ranging in topic. In poem after poem, she casts her unique imagination and unyielding, observant eye over the landscape of a life carefully and intuitively lived. We have Keep Moving by Maggie Smith. When Maggie Smith, the award-winning author of the viral poem, Good Bones, started writing inspirational daily Twitter posts in the wake of her divorce, they unexpectedly caught fire. In this deeply moving book of quotes and essays, Maggie writes about new beginnings as opportunities for transformation. Keep Moving celebrates the beauty and strength on the other side. This is a book for anyone who's gone through a difficult time and is wondering what comes next. The Incomplete List of Names by Michael Torres. An astonishing debut collection, looking back on a community of Mexican-American boys as they grapple with assimilation versus the impulse to create a world of their own. Who do we belong to? This is the question our author asks as he explores the roles that names, hometown language, and others' perceptions each play on our understanding of ourselves in an incomplete list of names. More than a boyhood ballad or a coming of age story, this collection illuminates the artist's struggle to make sense of the disparate identities others have forced upon him. Earthkeeper by N. Scott Mamaday. One of the most distinguished voices in American letters, N. Scott Mamaday has devoted much of his life to celebrating and preserving Native American culture, especially its oral tradition. A member of the Kiowa tribe who was born and grew up on Indian reservations throughout the Southwest, Amade has an intimate connection to the land he knows well and loves deeply. In Earth Keeper, he reflects on his native ground and its influence on his people. Amade reminds us that Earth is a sacred place of wonder and beauty, a source of strength and healing that must be protected before it's too late. As he so eloquently yet simply expresses, we must all be keepers of the Earth. And Make Me Rain by Nikki Giovanni. For more than 30 years, Nikki Giovanni's poetry has inspired, enlightened, and dazzled readers. Giovanni returns with this profound book of poetry in which she continues to call attention to injustice and give readers an unfiltered look into the most private parts of herself. Stirring, provocative, and resonant, the poems in Make Me Rain pierce the heart and nourish the soul. We have Light for the World to See by Kwame Alexander. From NPR correspondent and New York Times bestselling author, Kwame Alexander comes a powerful and provocative collection of poems that cut to the heart of the entrenched racism and oppression in America and eloquently explores ongoing events. A book in the tradition of James Baldwin's A Report from Occupied Territory, Light for the World to See is a rap session on race, a lyrical response to the struggles of Black lives in our world. 
Fevers, Feuds, and Diamonds, Ebola and the Ravages of History by Paul Farmer. In 2014, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea suffered the worst epidemic of Ebola in history. The brutal virus spread rapidly through a clinical desert where basic healthcare facilities were few and far between. Causing severe loss of life and economic disruption, the Ebola, Ebola crisis was a major tragedy of modern medicine. But why did it happen and what can we learn from it? Paul Farmer, the internationally renowned doctor and anthropologist, experienced the Ebola outbreak firsthand. He tells the harrowing stories of Ebola victims while showing why the medical response was slow and insufficient. He traces West Africa's chronic failures back to centuries of exploitation and injustice. This thorough and hopeful narrative is a definitive work of reportage, history, and advocacy, and a crucial intervention in public health discussions around the world. A Walk Around the Block by Spike Carlson. In this celebration of the seemingly mundane, Carlson opens our eyes to the engineering marvels, human stories, and natural wonders right outside our front door. He guides us through the surprising allure of sewers, the intricacies of power plants, the extraordinary path of an everyday letter, and the genius of recycling centers all the while revealing that this awesome world isn't just a spectator sport. Engaging as it is endearing, a walk around the block will change the way you see things in your everyday life. We have a new book by one of my favorite authors, David Sedaris. For more than 25 years, David Sedaris has been carving out a unique literary space. A Sedaris story may seem confessional, but it is also highly attuned to the world outside. It opens our eyes to what is absurd and moving about our daily existence, and it is almost impossible to read without laughing. Full of joy, generosity, and incisive humor, the best of me spans a career spent watching and learning and laughing, quite often at himself, and invites readers deep into the world of one of the most brilliant and original writers of our time. For true crime, we have keep, We Keep the Dead Close by Becky Cooper. 1969, the height of counterculture and the year universities would seek to curb the unruly spectacle of student protest. The winter that Harvard University would begin the tumultuous process of merging with Radcliffe, its all-female sister school, and the year that Jane Breton, an ambitious 23-year-old graduate student in Harvard's anthropology department and the daughter of Radcliffe Vice President J. Boyd Britton, would be found bludgeoned to death in her Cambridge, Massachusetts apartment. Forty years later, author Becky Cooper, a curious undergrad, will hear the first whispers of the story. In the first telling, the body was nameless. The story was this. A Harvard student had an affair with her professor, and the professor had murdered her in the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology because she threatened to talk about the affair. Though the rumor proves false, the story that unfolds, one that Cooper will follow for 10 years, is even more complex a tale of gender inequality in academia, a cowboy culture among empowered male athletes, the silencing effect of institutions, and our compulsion to rewrite the stories of female victims. We Keep the Dead Close is a memoir of mirrors, misogyny, and murder. It is at once a rumination on the violence and oppression that rules our revered institutions, a ghost story reflecting one young woman's past onto another, another's present, and a love story for a girl who was lost to history. The Killer's Shadow by John E. Douglas and Mark Holshaker. The legendary FBI criminal profiler and international best-selling author of Hunter and The Killer Across the Table returns with this timely relevant book that goes to the heart of extremism and domestic terrorism, examining in depth his chilling pursuit of an eventual prison confrontation with Joseph Paul Franklin, a white nationalist serial killer and one of the most disturbing psychopaths he has ever encountered. Detailing dogged pursuit of Franklin that employed profiling, psychology, and meticulous detective work, Douglas and Olshaker relate how the case was a make or break test for the still experimental behavioral science unit and revealed a new type of determined, mission driven serial killer whose only motivation was hate. A riveting cautionary tale rooted in history that continues to echo today. The Killer Shadow is a terrifying and essential exploration of the criminal personality and the vile grip of extremism and what happens when rage-filled speech evolves into deadly action and hatred of the other is allowed full reign. All right, two more. We have Be Water, My Friend, The Teachings of Bruce Lee by his daughter, Shannon Lee. Empty your mind, be formless, shapeless like water. Bruce Lee is a cultural icon renowned the world over for his martial arts and film legacy. 
but Lee was also a deeply philosophical thinker, learning at an early age that martial arts are more than just an exercise in physical discipline. They are an apt metaphor for living a fully realized life. Now in Be Water, my friend, Lee's daughter, Shannon, shares the concepts at the core of his philosophies, showing how they can serve as tools of personal growth and self-actualization. Through previously untold stories from her father's life and from her own journey in embodying these lessons, Shannon presents these philosophies in tangible, accessible ways. In our last book, we have Group by Christy Tate. The refreshing, refreshingly original debut memoir of a guarded, overachieving, self-lacerating young lawyer who reluctantly agrees to get psychologically and emotionally naked in a room full of six complete strangers, her psychotherapy group, and in turn finds human connection and herself. Group is a deliciously addictive read, and with Christy as our guide, skeptical of her own capacity for connection and intimacy, but hopeful in spite of herself, we are given a front row seat to the daring, exhilarating, painful, and hilarious journey that is group therapy, an unexplored process that breaks you down and then reassembles you so that all the pieces finally fit. And here are a bunch of more books that you will get to see in the presentation when I email them out, but I don't have time to talk about them, um, but definitely worth checking out. Thank you very much. And you can always email me there if you have questions about books, if you think I should order something, uh, if you have questions about programs, all kinds of stuff.